The American Dream, the promise of a good life for anyone willing to push limits, work hard, and do the impossible. To chase this dream, you need grit, desire, and most importantly, speed. This was the understanding of the average American in the 60s, so it was no surprise that between the 60s and 70s, Americans held the world in a chokehold when it came to performance in muscle cars. Grizzling, gritty engine noises? Check. Insane bodywork and design? Check. Blinding speed that got your heart racing and your mama worried? <laughs> Absolutely check. The American car brands were doing it and were freaking great at it. Ford, Chevy, Cadillac, and even Buick were on fire. Not literally, but you get the point. These brands had Americans and the auto world juiced up on the high of US-made performance cars, and people were having an absolutely great time. So great that it seemed like there was no end in sight. At least, that was what they thought until the 80s came. Ironically, the 80s was a great time for the world and the US. The Cold War ended, CNN started broadcasting, and we even saw Princess Diana and Prince Charles get married. So, you see, it was really an awesome time for most people in the world, except for the American auto industry. Car makers and gearheads were going through it, gas prices went up, and emission regulations followed. Car makers who used to focus on power and speed had to change their focus to fuel-efficient cars that saved fuel and reduced emissions. What made matters worse was that most of these car makers, because they used to focus on power, had little experience with adding interesting features to their cars. So, in a nutshell, the 80s unleashed a series of boring and low-performance cars on the auto world, and people groaned in response. But there is something about Americans not giving up. It is one of the things that Uncle Sam was popular for. Apart from great movies, a powerful military, and dictating the pace of pop culture. You have seen it in Hollywood movies, read it in autobiographies, and probably did it for yourself in real life. Having hope in despair, striving and working hard in the face of adversity, and screaming no to impossibility. This was what General Motors did in the dark days of the 1980s. The company had enough of the boring lineup that most car makers, including its own subsidiaries, had rolled out for customers and decided to do something about it. GM took matters into its own hands and decided to make American hearts and cars race again with the G-Body platform. Now, for people who don't know a lot about cars, a platform is the base upon which a car is built. Quite simple, right? Uh, not really. It's a lot more technical than that, but you don't need to worry about it. So let's leave that to the engineers. So the G-Body was a type of car platform, and it was made by General Motors. But unlike other car platforms, GM's G-Body was incredible. It was lightweight and allowed performance cars to come in smaller and lighter versions. It accepted a lot of engine types and designs, and finally, it is a body-on-frame mechanism and uses readily available parts. In simpler terms, it was the perfect auto platform begging to underpin perfect performance cars. Safe to say that General Motors and its subsidiaries obliged went to work and birthed the legendary 80s muscle cars. Cars that shone their lights, not headlights, on the drab, dry, and disturbingly boring car era of the 80s. Cars that raised the bar and reminded the world that America still knows how to build muscle cars. In this video, we'll review some of the most iconic 80s muscle cars that rode on the G-Body platform. The Buick Regal Type T is one of the few cars that had the honor of combining two adjectives, terrific and terrifying. Its body was terrific, and its speed was terrifying. Born from high banked ovals, this car rained terror on drag strips and the streets of America. It had a menacing grill that matched an equally menacing grunt its engine made while on the move. A grunt that tells you all you need to know about America's quest for speed and performance. 
The Buick T-Type was the sporty version of the Buick Regal that dominated the auto scene in the 80s. Released in 1985, it had an angular roofline that accentuated the boxy shape of the car and a powerful 3.8-liter V6 turbo engine that delivered 245 horsepower, 330 foot-pounds of torque, and a 0 to 60 mile per hour acceleration in 7.7 seconds. If you were a kid in the late 80s, a loud grunt on the street meant that someone was cruising around in the turbocharged Buick Regal T-Type. Of course, it was not the only turbocharged car around at the time, but the T-Type made a great difference with its electronic multi-port fuel injection, distributor-less ignition, and air-to-air -air intercooler. And the interior of the car? Pretty ironic. It was too mundane and gave off a vibe that betrays the beastly vehicle that is the Buick Regal T-Type. The interior would have made you feel like this beast is a Sunday car that you should only drive to church. It used couch-like button-tufted velour seats that made you want to fall asleep. Apart from the GNX and the Grand National, the Buick T-Type is one of the most outstanding muscle cars of the 80s. It was fast, it was black, it was the Buick Grand National. In the early 80s, the Grand National was the best muscle you wanted, and the good thing is, you can get it in any color, as long as it is black. It was the car that moved Buick from being a non-existent relative to General Motors, kind of like that weird uncle that never wants to talk and you only see once in 10 years, to a force to reckon with in the performance and muscle car conversation. This beast was named after the NASCAR Grand National Series that Buick won in the 1981 and 1982 seasons as a marketing stunt, playing into the what wins on Sunday sells on Monday marketing trope. Buick sent 200 15 units of its Regal model to the Cars and Concept factory, where they were retrofitted with the Grand National package, thus birthing the Buick Grand National. Truth be told, the first generation of the Grand National did not really hit the mark that much. And that makes sense because it was basically a rush job. It was like the stiff suits at Buick woke up one day and decided to make an upgraded version of the Buick Regal. The same way you started reading for a test the morning of the test, we all know how that ends. The outstanding version of the Buick Grand National did not come until 1984. The new version came in an all-black uniform fitted with a 3.8-liter V6 engine that uses refined sequential fuel injection and a distributionless computer-controlled ignition. This engine produced 200 horsepower and 300 foot-pounds of torque and pushed the car to finish a quarter mile in 15.9 seconds. To know how badass this was, the Corvette, which was the fastest car at the time, completed the same distance in 15.2. In an era when emission control was choking manufacturers and killing horsepower, the Grand National was a beast, and the American market welcomed it. Buick made 2,000 units of this car, and it sold out very quickly. I told you that Americans love speed and loud engine noises. The car would later undergo several modifications in 1985 and 1986, resulting in the most badass Buick cars ever made. The Grand National at the time now completed the quarter mile in 14 seconds and revved from 0 to 60 miles per hour in under 5 seconds. By all standards, it was the fastest production car at the time. Take a minute and let that sink in. A Buick was America's fastest production car. Beating and bullying the likes of Chevy Camaro, Ford Mustang, and Corvette on the tracks and in the streets. All of these with a V6 engine. By 1987, Buick announced that the year would be the last for the Grand National, and to send off this legendary nameplate, it launched the 1987 GNX, which stood for Grand National Experimental. To make the GNX, Buick selected 547 of its Grand National and sent them to McLaren. Yes, the F1 McLaren the insane super sports car McLaren. And McLaren did what it does best. It fitted these cars with bigger turbos, newer ECUs, bigger intercoolers, bigger exhausts, and better suspension components. In the end, it was louder, faster, and definitely way more badass than the original Grand Nationals. What were you expecting when you handed a beast to freaking Bruce McLaren? He made the beast even wilder. On paper, the GNX was supposed to come with 276 horsepower and 360 foot-pounds of torque. But by the time track testing started, everyone was blown out of their friggin' minds. 
The car went from 0 to 60 miles per hour in 4.6 seconds and completed a quarter mile in 12.7 seconds. This is only 0.3 seconds faster than the Ferrari F40 and about 1 second faster than the Porsche 930. Hell, the only car that was faster than the Buick GNX in the whole world at the time was the Lamborghini Countach. If you don't know how insane that is, we are sorry. We cannot help you. No analogy sufficiently explains it. The GNX was Buick's ride to the pinnacle of untouchable performance and the company retired the champion after that ride. It was proved that Buick had nothing to prove to anyone when it came to the performance and muscle car conversation in the US and the world in general. Okay, we don't know about you, but we definitely miss the GNX even more now. And talking about missing, we may have news for you. While the American muscle car scene today is filled with Mustangs, Camaros, and Hellcats racing and grunting past each other, year after year, Buick renewed the trademark of the Grand National and GNX some years ago. Now, we won't do enough justice to the history of GMG body vehicles without mentioning other outstanding vehicles that used the same platform and made history as some of the leading muscle cars in the 80s. These cars did not only come with exciting features as muscle cars, but they also got tuned and modified by many people seeking to get even more performance from them. Some of these cars include... This beauty from Chevy was built in 1959 as a coupe utility vehicle. It combined the two-door design of a coupe and the cargo bed of a utility vehicle. Despite being around since 1959, it was the fifth generation of the car, released in 1982 that used the G-Body platform. This time, it was slimmer and copied the Malibu design, and it came with a stronger V6 engine that increased its horsepower. The Malibu started as one of the trim level of the Chevy Chevelle until the manufacturer made it into a distinct nameplate in 1978. With the G-Body platform, the Malibu was able to shed off about 500 pounds of its weight and also a foot shorter while increased leg room, headroom, and trunk space, making it even better and more sought after by gearheads at the time. The Malibu came in two trim levels, the Malibu and the Malibu Classic as well as three body styles such as sedan, station wagon, and coupe. While the car used a V6 engine, Chevy built a V8 option for people who wanted more juice from their Malibu. Built in 1986, this Monte Carlo was one of the most popular sets of vehicles that epitomized how good the G-Body platform was. Unlike the El Camino, it was a proper two-door coupe and was marketed as a personal luxury car. It was even the first personal luxury made and sold by Chevrolet. When the G-Body rave started, people wanted more from iconic GM vehicles, and the Monte Carlo SS was one of those that made the cut. Oldsmobile is one of the subsidiaries of GM that many people are not familiar with, at least not today. But in the 70s and 80s, the brand was up there among the leading muscle cars. One of its models that made this possible was the Cutlass. The Oldsmobile Cutlass model came in different generations and, of course, with different high-performing engines. There was the Cutlass Supreme, the Cutlass Supreme Classic, and the Cutlass Cruiser. These three models come with gritty, loud engines that delivered lots of juice and speed for muscle car junkies in the 80s. This 442 was one of the outstanding muscle cars built by Oldsmobile between 1964 and 87. It was introduced as a performance option for the Cutlass and F85 models, but by 1968, it became a standalone model in itself. 